Hello, and welcome to today's Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center ASHTO Bike Guide webinar series. Today's webinar is titled, On-Road Facilities Part 2, Shared Lanes, Paved Shoulders, Bicycle Boulevards, and Traffic Signals. And we will be speaking with Bill Schulteis, PE, Senior Engineer at Tool Design Group, and Tina Fink, PE, Traffic Engineer, also at Tool Design Group. My name is James Gallagher, and I am the PBIC Communications Manager. I'll be facilitating today's webinar. I'd first like to say hello to today's speakers, make sure they are ready, and that everyone can hear them. Bill, are you there? And Tina, do we have on the line as well? This is Bill Schulteis. I'm on the line. Hi, this is Tina Fink. Attendees, if you can hear me and if you can hear our speakers, please click the hand in the icon, I'm sorry, the hand icon in the box in the upper right corner of your screen. This lets us know that you can hear us. Great, I'm seeing lots of hands. Before we get started with today's webinar, I want to go over a few administrative details and the functionality of the webinar, webinar software. If for some reason your computer or web browser freezes during the webinar, please reload the website and log back into the program. You will be able to rejoin this session. Please note that attendees will not be able to speak during the webinar. We do expect a large number of attendees in this call, so by meeting your audio, it helps us cut down on confusion and background noise. As an attendee, you have a control box in the upper right corner of your screen that collapses and expands by clicking the double arrows. Though you are not able to speak, you do have the ability to ask questions by entering them in the question box. If you have a problem during the webinar, you may enter it here. I'll monitor these questions and respond to you if I am able. Questions pertaining to the presentation may be asked at any time, but they will not be addressed until the end of the program when we have built in about 20 minutes for discussion period. Please feel free to ask questions as we go along, and we'll try to get to them after the presentation. When you head to the webinar, there's a brief survey that will pop up. We would very much appreciate your feedback on our performance. Following today's webinar, you will receive an email from GoToMeeting. Please do not delete this email. This email con contains a link to download a printable certificate of attendance for one and a half hours of instruction. If there are multiple attendees at your site, please forward the link to other participants they can download a print certificate with their name. This webinar has been approved by AICP for one and a half DM credits. The Road Safety Academy, the training and education arm of the UNC Highway Safety Research Center, is a registered provider of CM credits. For more information on the Road Safety Academy, please visit www.rsa.unc.edu. Also, ASHTO has agreed to provide a 20% discount to attendees of this webinar series. Details for how to get that discount will be provided in the follow-up email. Again, please do not delete that email until you get your attendance certificate and ASHTO discount. I believe we have worked out all the kinks with downloading the discount flyer, but please let me know if you have any trouble. This is the fourth of seven webinars on the ASHTO Bike Guide. For more information on those and other future webinars, or to view the archives from this webinar series and others, please visit www.walkinginfo.org slash webinars. In addition to these webinars, PBIC offers four different in-person training courses to provide technical assistance to professionals and community members in developing pedestrian safety action plans and improving conditions for walking. These courses can be found at www.walkinginfo.org slash training. Before we start the feature presentation, I want to take two quick polls from the audience. Okay, first I just want to confirm that you can see my screen. Yes, I can see it. All right, well, it's good to be back. Uh, welcome back, those of you that have been on previous webinars, and for those of you that are new, uh, excited to have you join us. This is, as James mentioned, uh, the fourth of a series of webinars. I'm going to talk in today's um, webinar is about non-bike lane, on-road bikeway design, which is distinct from our last webinar, which focused strictly on bicycle lanes on the road. We are going to be having a conversation, live tweeting this on the, on the webinar on Twitter. So if you want to participate in that discussion online, you're welcome to join us at Tool Design. And if you want to keep it, the topic focused to group the discussion together, you can use the hashtag 
ashto or hashtag bike guide. It's a fun way uh, to participate in a discussion with colleagues around the United States and uh, our tool staff will be um, tweeting some of the main points of the webinar as we go along. So we mentioned this is the fourth uh, webinar. Today is uh, September 18th, On-Road Bikeways Part 2. Last, uh, the last webinar covered on-road bikeways, which focused on bike lanes, uh, including intersections. We had a prior webinar that focused on planning and uh, planning for bicycle travel and master plans and on-road uh, projects. So we're not going to repeat any of that. We're just going to continue to move forward uh, through this webinar. The next webinar will be October 9th. It'll be shared use paths, and we'll give you general design principles to approach pathway design and pathway geometry. And that's another uh, chapter of the guide that's been greatly expanded. So that, uh, the same as Chapter 4, that, that uh, webinar is going to be split into two components. Uh, the October 9th webinar and October 23rd, so we'll hope you'll come back for those. So as I mentioned, today's webinar, we're going to be focusing on on-road design for bi bicycling, uh, focusing primarily on the significant updates and new content, uh, focus major topics or shared lanes, extensive discussion on shared lanes, shared lane markings, um, there's been some adjustments to the paved shoulder discussion. There's now a lot more discussion about bicycle travel on freeways and bridges. Uh, there's an entire new section on bicycle boulevards. And we've expanded upon the discussion for wayfinding guide signs. And we've significantly upgraded, and we'll go through this today, discussion on bicycle signals uh, and considering bicyclists in normal signalized intersections and bicycle detection. As James mentioned, in this, uh, you have an opportunity as a participant to get a discount on the Ashto Bike Guide. Uh, this is a web link. Uh, again, he's going to email you a notice about this that gives you the promo to, to get the discounted web guide. But if you want to get a jump on it, you can take note of this web link now. Uh, for those of you that were here the last time, a little bit um, repeat at the beginning, but it's important to set the context uh, for design and understanding the relationship between the AASHTO bike guide and other design guidelines. So first, um, AASHTO is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide technical support to each state to efficiently move people and goods and more simply stated, to develop a set of uniform standards that apply to roadway design throughout the United States from state to state. Those guides are often transferred to individual states and localities where they take the, the AASHTO guidance and develop more detailed guidance that fits their particular local needs. The last AASHTO bicycle guide was written in 1990, was published in 1999, largely written from 96 to 98. So obviously, there's been quite a lag in time since that period, and a lot of things have changed. This new guide is about twice the content of the 1999 guide and reflects a lot of research and innovations that were tested and, and in place throughout the United States over the last 15 years. Um, it's important to recognize that there's a really critical difference in the engineering profession between standards and guidance. Um, Standards are things that are required. And you see standards in the METCD. Uh, you know, traffic uh, traffic stop signs are, are red. They have to be red. We don't have green stop signs. So those are referred to as shall conditions. You know, stop signs shall be red colored. Uh, and that's an important distinction between guidelines, which is what the Astro Bicycle Guide is, is a guideline where the language in the guide is should or may. Uh, and those are recommendations that you may deviate from with, with engineering judgment and site-specific criteria. Um, again, I mentioned the METCD's relationship to this. The METCD is adopted through federal law uh, as a national standard that uh, agencies are required to follow. 
uh, as show by itself. It's not a standard unless it's made a standard through adoption in uh, local law or ordinance through a state DOT or local DOT. Um, there's a big difference between an innovation and accepted practice. Um, you're allowed to innovate through the METCD, through ASHTO, uh, but they, innovating by itself is not enough to get them into ASHTO or the METCD. Uh, accepted practice is, is an experimentation and evaluation is really the standard before things are put into these guides, that there needs to be a period of time that they've been tested, used, in, in widespread use, relatively widespread use, and shown to be effective and, and safe uh, for the intended purpose before they're put into a, a national guideline such as ASHTO. Other guidance that is important to consider is PROWAG. Um, it comes more into play in shared use path situations. Uh, but it could have implications for situations that I'll talk about today of accommodating bicyclists on bridges or roundabouts. Uh, it's important to understand the, that uh, accessibility guidelines are also written in the federal law and that they must be complied with on different design projects. Other guides that we look to are obviously the Highway Capacity Manual influences bicycle design on roads uh, where local agencies or state governments look to highway capacity criteria to make decisions about things such as road diets or uh, provisions for bicyclists. The new highway capacity manual actually has for the first time a uh, new chapter, new discussion on bicyclist quality of service, uh, which is really a measure of their comfort. This is something that's been in pretty widespread use for the last 10 to 15 years. We've talked about it during the planning webinar, uh, but it's now implicitly referenced in the ASHTO bike guide and it's incorporated into the ASH, into the 2010 Highway Capacity Manual. The NACTO guide is a new um, design guideline developed primarily by large urban cities through a collaboration of large urban cities throughout the United States. Uh, they cover a number of topics that are specific to bicyclists on roads and off roads. It's a great source of information for solutions that are currently experimental, um, have not been in widespread use or relatively newly implemented in the United States. Um, they provide guidance for how to, considerations for how to consider these newer treatments. And NACTO sets a, a great place to look to for, for treatments that are evolving in the field. Um, and then again, as I mentioned before, once things evolve to the point where it's clear what the safety benefits are and the criteria, what the design parameters should be. The next step is to incorporate into a, a national standard such as ASHTO. Um, ASHTO and NACTO are really should be seen as complementary uh, design guidelines, one supporting the other. There are many, many items in NACTO uh, that are not, ex not explained, such as bicycle stopping site distance that are geometric de design based that are critical for designers to understand, to be able to apply the, the principles and to do innovative treat some of the innovative treatments described in NACTO. So it's not an either or, it's really a both uh, type of need to understand these two important design guidelines. Same applies for the ASHTO Green Book for streets and highways. Um, generally, you know, a lot of bicycling happens on our public roadway system without special accommodation. So if you follow the principles of good design in the Green Book, you're generally going to get um, good quality cycling elements of good sight distance, uh, roadways that have good vertical and horizontal curves so that you have, again, it feeds into good sight lines, um, and, and shoulders on rural situations or suburban type situations on roads that can really function well for cyclists with adequate width. So before we get into the details about specific treatments, it's important to remember the concept of engineering judgment. Um, any guideline cannot um, cover all specific situations that you may encounter for your particular project. It's, there's, the purpose of guidelines is to give you the design principles to follow the engineering knowledge of the physics involved and the 
bicyclist movement, the motorist movement, that is the science behind the decisions that are made to make deviations as necessary to solve your local problems. Um, it's really important to keep that in mind that there is built-in flexibility in these guidelines because there is the understanding that we cannot create a guideline for every conceivable situation. The first topic that uh, we're going to discuss today that's specific to on-road cycling is the shared lanes. Uh, as I just mentioned with the Astro Green Book, shared lanes exist everywhere. They're all public roadways, essentially, unless bicycling is specifically prohibited. Uh, features that create high-quality experience for cyclists in shared lanes, uh, a good quality level of service, are streets that have low volumes or speeds, high-quality pavement, you know, and again, the other features of good sight lines or uh, drainage grates that, that are not a danger to cyclists. Uh, last important consideration of a quality network of shared lanes is that you actually have access to traffic signals uh, on your roadway network. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Shared lane widths can really vary from any lane width, but these are important dimensions to keep in mind. Uh, lane widths of 13 feet or less require motorists to essentially partially change lanes or fully change lanes for, to pass a cyclist. Uh, it's not really physically possible or safe for a motorist to try to pass a bicyclist within a lane that's 13 feet or narrower. So we consider those narrow lanes. Uh, lanes of 14 feet or more actually allow a motorist to pass a bicyclist within the same lane. We consider those wide outside lanes. Generally, it's the guide discourages lane widths of 16 feet or more as it, it's possible that you could end up with motorists in congested urban areas or congested situations approaching freeway ramps or something uh, where they might try to double up and, and pass each other within that 16 feet of space. Again, here's a photograph illustrating uh, the point I made. So. Wide outside lane, again, as you can see here, the truck is able to pass the cyclist, uh, leaving that cyclist uh, two or three feet of space uh, between them clearance. And that cyclist, as well, has got uh, two to three feet of space away from the curb and the gutter so that everybody is relatively comfortable on that situation and can pass each other safely. Give you a second to digest this photograph, but this is not an uncommon situation in an urban area where we basically have shared lanes. And I'll be curious, I won't be able to get your feedback, but see if there's anything that looks unusual to you in the photograph. Again, what we see and what we find in research is on roadways that don't have specific markings for cyclists, especially in congested urban areas, uh, and then higher speed ur uh, suburban areas, I, I see this quite a bit, is you get a lot of wrong way cycling. Um, a lot of bicyclists take in that uh, training that's given to people early on in their youth to, when they're walking on a roadway without a special provision to face traffic, and then they carry that into their bicycle riding experience. This can be one of the leading causes of crashes for cyclists. Um, and one solution that's available and has been available is to actually post wrong way signs uh, on that wrong way direction. Another aspect of that is trying to encourage the cyclist to feel more comfortable in the lane. Uh, a couple signs that are uh, one sign that's been available a long time is the share of the road. It's been used quite a bit. Uh, a new sign that's new to the manual that was uh, also now in the METCD is the bicycles may use full lane sign. And the guide talks about the application of these signs relative to thinking about the lane width of that space. So thinking back to the, the lane width discussion we just had, the guide is suggesting that it may be more appropriate to use the full lane, bikes may use full lane sign on narrow lane situations. And the share of the road sign on situations where the um, travel lanes are greater than 13 feet. Here's just a photographic example of the application in these two situations. On the left-hand side, you have a share of the road application where the travel lane is actually greater than 13 feet in width. 
um, in a share their own cell, and, and, and this locality was considered to be the appropriate treatment. As you see, there's no special uh, marking on the roadway. The photograph on the right is a narrower lane. Um, in this case, the, the Bicycles May Useful Lane sign is posted along with a shared lane marking. And you'll notice that the shared lane marking is actually placed approximately, because the lane is narrow, approximately in the middle of the lane. The bicycle guide actually speaks a little bit about the difference between wide outside lanes and bicycle lanes, and it, it strongly encourages consideration of bike lanes as being a more appropriate and preferred facility than wide outside lanes when you're in an urban or suburban setting. Uh, it's largely because of some of the reasons we've talked about, but discouraging wrong way riding, but creating an increased comfort level, referring back to the bicycle level of service modeling that's now been developed and incorporated in the Highway Capacity Manual. When you're in a rural situation, um, shared lanes are generally fine when you have good sight lines, low traffic volumes, at speeds of 55 miles an hour or less. Uh, there's a lot of roadways in the United States that comprise, that, ha that have these conditions, uh, and they've been, they're great bicycling routes, and many of them are designated as local, state, or even uh, national U.S. bicycle routes today to provide a high quality service to the cyclists. The guide does speak to the fact, though, that as you get, um, there are situations where it's better to have a paved shoulder than a shared lane, and that it's generally preferable to have a paved shoulder than a shared lane, if possible. Again, it increases comfort, and it's a couple of important considerations of this is that um, on rural roads with higher speeds, a much larger proportion of rural crashes with cyclists are uh, rear end or, or overtaking crashes, and many of those are often fatal. Uh, so providing a shoulder actually has many positive benefits for uh, motor vehicles and pavement longevity, but it also has real safety benefit uh, for cyclists and even pedestrians. It's important to note on uh, paved shoulders that they are not bike lanes. There's no marking specific to them. Um, bike lanes with the pavement markings and local regulations are considered travel lanes. Uh, parking is prohibited when you have paved shoulders unless parking you know, parking signs are posted. Uh, parking is generally okay. It may not be that common, but it's something that uh, is generally seen as acceptable. It's a, a very critical distinction. Uh, paved shoulders should be a minimum of four feet width when it's an open road section, as you see in that photograph. If there's a curb or a guardrail or other physical barrier, the width should be increased to five feet. Lastly, considering bicyclists comfort and level of service, higher speed roadways and higher traffic roadways uh, are roadways that have a lot of truck volume. Additional width in that shoulder can be very beneficial. There's a new component to the guide and discussion for paved shoulders at intersections, and they actually we discuss the concept of creating short stretches of bike lanes on approaches to, to larger street intersections with a lot of turning conflicts. Um, to get cyclists to position correctly, to get right turning motorists to the right of them, and basically create through bicycle lanes even for short stretches as you see in this photograph, where on this uh, suburban road, if there's a right turn lane developed to decelerate and turn onto the street, and then there's an acceleration lane, which is coming towards you in the photograph, for the motor vehicle speed to pick up speeds and merge back into the lane. So there's a dash bicycle lane that uh, maintains the bicyclist's proper riding position to ensure their safety uh, demonstrated in this photograph. Here's another example of a shoulder where instead of tapering it, as might be usual, where the shoulder would just taper uh, away towards that side street, implying uh, the end of the facility. Uh, there's no taper. It actually continues as a continuous dash, shouldering to guide the um, cyclist and the motorist, motor traffic that's proceeding straight through. Uh, many state DOTs have been constructing what are called bypass lanes at T-intersections, where there's a motorist stopped in the road to make a left-hand turn. 
and on many shoulders you'll see motorists will pass that stopped vehicle um, encroaching on the shoulder. So the guide speaks to this condition and suggests that if you're going to retrofit a roadway for this uh, maneuver that you actually don't forget about cyclists and you don't eliminate that space, you preserve at least a minimum four foot of separated bicycling space uh, in, in the shoulder adjacent to the bypass lane. Looking back to the last webinar, we talked a little bit about climbing lanes for bicycle lanes. They actually have application and constrained roadway sections for shoulders. Be very beneficial for safety on steep grade roadways. Um, if you don't have room for an equal width shoulder or a, a shoulder that is wide enough for a bike lane on two sides of the road, it might make a lot of sense to offset it to one side of the road uh, so that cyclists have a climbing lane, essentially. Another location for spot widening that would have uh, very positive uh, safety benefits for cyclists is widening the inside corners of horizontal curves, such as you see in this photograph, where it's difficult uh, to see around the corner for approaching motorists, cyclists who could be on the roadway just ahead of them. Uh, these are good locations to consider spot widening to improve safety until you get the necessary sight lines developed and established. Rumble strips have been another um, type of safety device that have been put into widespread use throughout the United States. Um, they've got a real positive safety benefit for motorists to prevent run off the road crashes, uh, but the unintended consequences is they can be dangerous for cyclists and cause them to lose control. The guide speaks to this and actually puts in the graphic, as you see here, some suggested dimensions and gaps so that cyclists can transition from the roadway space to the shoulder and back and forth safely. The guide has an extensive discussion on shared lanes, marked shared lanes. Um, unlike the shared lanes we were just talking about, which have been unmarked, and, and shoulders, which are unmarked with a symbol, uh, the shared lane marking was developed uh, a number of years ago and put into the MUTCD to create a physical marking on the roadway that denoted where cyclists should, their optimum position to ride in a shared lane situation. Um, I'm listing here a number of situations that may be applied. I, I think you can just simplify and say you can basically use these almost anywhere uh, on a shared lane situation with maybe a couple exceptions that you'd want to think about. Um, they're not appropriate to mark on paved shoulders or in bike lanes. We should be designating those as bike lanes with bike lane symbols if that's uh, the determination as the best approach. And you should also exercise caution if you're going to put shared lanes on roadways that are really high volume or high speed, such as the, the photograph that you're seeing on the screen. Uh, there haven't been any studies of those situations, and it's unclear um, what benefits that they may provide to cyclists in those, in those situations. That said, I would like to emphasize the guide doesn't prohibit their use in those situations, and, and neither does the METCD. Um, again, this is an example of using engineering judgment for your local conditions and um, agency's comfort level for marking a shared lane in these situations. Shared lane marking, um, the guide discusses a number of situations where you may place a, a considerations for placing the marking within the lane. Um, and these are just the suggested minimum distances. Uh, the minimums are not intended to mean a standard that they go at that number. That's the starting point, and then you can you can shift them further from those numbers, uh, depending on your local circumstances. As far as placing the symbols, the frequency, again, you have a lot of flexibility in how close you'd like to put them together. That's frequently a decision that's made partially on cost and maintenance. Uh, but as a general minimum, it's suggested in the guide that they be placed immediately after an intersection and then not more than 250 feet apart. Uh, the farther apart the shares are spaced, the harder it is for the cyclist to track them. Here's an example of another application. Um, we talked about this uh, during the bike lane session, but it's now been given interim approval, the use of green uh, in bicycle lanes. 
The green can also be used to silhouette a bike symbol, as you can see in this photograph, the shared lane marking. And this is an example as well of an application of the markings at a much closer spacing of 30 to 50 feet apart to really emphasize that travel path. When marked shared lanes or shared lane markings are placed against two uh, parked vehicles, they should be a minimum of 11 feet from the face of curb to the center of the shared lane marking. Um, there's generally a discussion about considerations of when and why you might move that further out into the lane. And as we talked about earlier, if you have narrow travel lanes where it's not safe or not practical for a motorist to pass you within the same lane, it may make sense to have the shared lane marking in the middle of the lane to encourage cyclists to control the lane. Other applications might be steep grades where the cyclists are uh, going at a relatively high speed and the speed differential between the cyclist and the motorist is not that high or situations in an urban district such as you see in the photograph where the parking turnover may be high and the chances of being doored, uh, the cyclist being struck by an opening car door are much greater. A climbing lane um, is an example, again, of where we, an application of where we'd like to use a shared lane marking to supplement a bicycle lane. Um, the bicycle lane is applied in the uphill direction where they're moving much slower and they can have their own space to operate comfortably at their own speed. Uh, the shared lane marking is placed in the downhill direction. It's really important that if you're going to install climbing lanes that are, have marked bicycle lanes, that you in, install the complementary shared lane marking in the downhill direction. And even on some roadway situations, you may decide uh, the cross section so tight that you could possibly do bike lanes in both directions, but given the speeds and parking turnover that it may be more advisable to have a wider bicycle lane in the uphill direction uh, and have the shared lane marking positioned further away from the parked vehicles in the downhill direction. Uh, climbing lanes don't necessarily have to stay on the same side of the road if your terrain is shifting, such as in this photograph. Um, they can flip directions. Uh, the next step for this picture is obviously to add some markings, but uh, the, the point of this slide is to actually show you the idea, the concept of flipping the climbing lane from one side of the road to the other to work with your existing terrain. You also have applications on flat terrain where it may be desirable to have a bike lane in one direction uh, where the roadway is too narrow and then in these situations it makes uh, it's a really good idea and strongly encouraged to have a shared lane marking in the opposite direction to reduce wrong way riding. And lastly shared lane markings are also a useful tool to guide around hazardous to position cyclists to, to maximize their visibility in situations that could be potentially hazardous, such as this location where the sight lines are restricted by a tight curb and vegetation, um, and some parking that may or may not be present on the far side uh, because there's intermittent parking. So this encourages cyclists to come out, take the lane, take control of the lane through this curve so that they don't suddenly swerve out in front of a motorist where the, the sight lines aren't so, so good, creating a situation for a potential crash. The shared lane markings shouldn't be forgot about for construction projects. Uh, they have a lot of application and potential in construction projects as a, a mitigation strategy during lane closures. Uh, this is an example of a bridge project in Boston where uh, a, a bridge was narrowed to re be reconstruct each of the lanes, resulting in bicyclists having to share a narrow travel lane. So during that construction project, shared lane markings were placed uh, on within the travel lane in conjunction with bikes may use full lane signs during the construction period. Shared lane markings may also have usefulness in right turn lanes if it's a situation where you have a short development of a right turn lane. So for example, you have shoulders, paved shoulders, or bicycle lanes that are terminated to develop a right turn lane for a short stretch and the cyclists aren't going to typically change lanes to the through lane to pass it, the low volume right turn lane. Um, it may be desirable to actually just mark shared lane markings where the cyclists will most typically ride, uh, which would be within the center of that turn lane. 
There's a lot of expanded discussion on bridges, viaducts, and tunnels. Uh, a main theme of this discussion is that bicyclists should be accommodated on the majority of these situations unless the roadway uh, unless the roadway prohibits cycling. And even then, you should look at it from a network perspective where it may be desirable even on a limited access bridge to provide bicycle accommodation across uh, whatever uh, the feature is that they're crossing, be it a river, lake, or a railroad. This is a good example of a situation where the, the cyclist is uh, pinched considerably as they approach the bridge, and it can create a very uncomfortable uh, and even dangerous situation for them where they have space and suddenly the space is narrowed or eliminated completely uh, across a stretch of roadway and especially across longer stretches of bridges. Generally, when bridges get to be a half mile or more in length, it's desirable to have a shared use path on one or both sides of the bridges. Um, if you're in an urbanized area, it'd be preferable to have it on both sides of the bridges unless you really strongly design uh, safe and efficient street crossings on both sides of the bridges to uh, create safe travel across the bridge for, for those users. You may create separate uh, bicycle only trails or spaces or shared use paths such are shown on these bridges. Uh, there's a couple great examples. Actually, these are two of the best probably in the United States. Uh, the one on the left is the Cooper River Bridge in Charleston, South Carolina, a signature landmark bridge. Uh, and the bridge on the right is the Interstate 90 Bridge in Seattle, uh, where again, those are two examples where the, the road itself is limited access. Bicyclists and pedestrians are prohibited. Uh, but there were efforts and recognitions that these were important connections in a larger network and that it made sense to add these high quality connections for both cyclists and pedestrians uh, to complete the uh, cycling and walking networks in these communities. It may be necessary in those situations to consider limited access uh, for cyclists uh, on the approaches to these uh, bridge, bridges or tunnels where the limited access is provided. Here's an example where uh, in the state of Maryland has actually signed some bicyclists operating on the shoulder on what is normally a limited access freeway where they're prohibited. Uh, so they've signed it to make it legal and they've designated the locations on those approaches where it is legal, provided adequate signing so that people can find those important connections. Lastly, it may be desirable to provide both a, a side shared use path and a shoulder on the bridge. So there may be situations where you have strong on-road connections where you want to keep that continuous across the bridge and not sever that and divert everyone to a shared use path. A couple retrofit examples are one, you can widen sidewalks on bridges to create a shared use path or a wider sidewalk. Ideally, you would still remain uh, some space for a shoulder as is shown in the picture on the left. Other examples are retrofits to some of our uh, graded bridges where you can get a lightweight concrete fill so that it's a smooth surface for bicycle travel across the grates. A couple other innovative treatments are to sign um, with markings, uh, places to separate pedestrians and cyclists so they are not uh, conflicting with each other, especially in denser urban areas such as the bridge on the left in Portland. Or in situations where you have long tunnels where the roadway pinches, it's a, it's a historically narrow road and a, a tunnel that can't be widened, to create activated warning devices so that when a bicyclist is traveling through the bridge that the motorist approaching them is aware of that. There's a number of principles that are explained for bicyclists traveling on freeways, uh, freeway design considerations, and interacting with freeways is thinking about bicycle level of service to determine appropriate width of the shoulder of bike lane and to really focus on making sure that the conflict areas are very clear to the cyclist and to the motorist uh, before they approach it and at the approach. It's also critical that a continuous facility is provided on both sides of these types of roadways. On approaches to ramps and interchange, there's often uh, separate turn lanes are developed. It's important that the cycle lane or shoulder is not striped to the right of these turn lanes and that they be designed like bicycle lanes. Other key features are to try to avoid high-speed merge designs um, and try to limit the, 
the interactions of cyclists with turning motorists to be slow speed and as close to right angles as possible at intersections. Here's two examples the guide uh, goes into detail on for the, uh, merging ramps onto roadways is, is the top one is allowing cyclists to choose their space to merge within that ramp area. And the second option at the lower picture is to channelize them to a, a confined location to cross, which may be parallel to a pedestrian crossing. There's discussion on uh, single point diamond interchanges. A uh, couple key features of these, um, they're, they're being installed with more regularity around the United States. But the guide highlights uh, a couple key points. And one, probably the most critical, is the length of these and size of these. It's really essential to check the signal timing for cyclists. They don't get trapped in the middle of these uh, interchanges, putting themselves at, at risk of being hit uh, by other traffic unexpectedly. The other is to create separate right turn lanes for entrances to the limited access highway part of this and to tighten the turn geometry for exits and merges. Another bit of new discussion is talking about bicyclist treatments at roundabouts. There's been shown to be a crash reduction for cyclists in roundabouts if they are designed for low speed traffic, with single lane roundabouts being preferred. Uh, the guide speaks to a concept of not designing the roundabout and, and operating it for the traffic projected 20 years from now, but to operate it for the traffic as it exists today. So an example would be if it, traffic volume projects you to two-lane roundabout in the future, that you install it as a one-lane roundabout so that it's safe for the users and cyclists in the, in the near term, and that you have the option to add that second lane uh, once that traffic materializes. Bicyclists also have the option to exit and to the sidewalk and take it as pedestrians. So the first is treatment, which the guy goes into detail on, is cyclists taking the lane and staying within the roundabout provides pretty good guidance uh, for how to design that approach in a safe manner so there's enough time for cyclists to see gaps in traffic and merge in with traffic to take the lane. It also provides guidance of where you make considerations for adding curb cuts and transitions to the sidewalk with a number of design principles for treating the sidewalk uh, with cyclists. At locations where there's a lot of pedestrian volume, it, the guide speaks about the concept of creating a separate bicycle only space parallel to the pedestrian space. The guide also gives you a number of design principles for how to deal with uh, pro-ag guidelines and how to ensure that we minimize the chances of confusion between uh, visually impaired pedestrians thinking the ramp is for them and not for cyclists. There's new discussion on railroad grade crossings that speak to the general principles of what are safe grade crossings. The photograph as shown is probably not considered safe. It's not smooth. Uh, it's got the flange way is kind of rough and torn up, and it's no, not clearly marked on how a cyclist would transition through here. The guy talks about the principles that would result in these types of designs, where you can actually widen the roadway and create a place to cross the tracks at a closer to 60 to 90 degree angle through uh, spot widening, as shown on the left. Another option is to actually use pavement markings, such as the bike lane on the right, and using that green to emphasize the correct alignment to cross the tracks without um, risking yourself, of the cyclist risking a chance of a fall by hitting the track at the wrong angle. There's expanded discussion about treatments for drainage grates and utility covers and some examples of how to retrofit them. This photograph actually shows a retrofit with some welded crossbars um, so that the wheel doesn't fall into the grate. Uh, the guide suggests a number of grate styles that are more likely to be safe for a cyclist to traverse across. The guide speaks to a number of considerations for the drainage grate placement, uh, with the goal being to maintain at least a minimum four feet of operating width. Uh, regardless of whether it's a shoulder or a bicycle lane, uh, between the, the lane line and the edge of the gutter or the 
uh, edge of the drain as it's shown here. The drainage grate. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Tina, and she's going to walk you through the uh, expanded discussion on traffic signals in the guide. So the 2012 guide uh, has much stronger language compared to the previous guide on traffic signal design and traffic signal timing for bicyclists. Uh, specifically, the guide states that bicyclist needs are different for motorists, and it's advisable to adjust signal operations and signal timings for bicyclists. Uh, there's expanded technical guidance. Uh, one thing specifically, the guide uh, assumes one speed acceleration and deceleration for a starting point for all signal timing calculations. However, the guide also recognizes that local conditions such as uh, steep grade or crossing with a lot of school children may warrant using different values. Uh, the New guide and the previous guide uh, have similar guidance for uh, minimum green time and yellow change interval. Important thing to note is both guides um, indicate that the yellow time is time for uh, motor vehicles is typically adequate for bicyclists. And also the red clearance and green extension time have updated guidance. And the new guide has additional information on detection for bicyclists and also some guidance on when it uh, may be appropriate to use, to have a signal for the exclusive use of bicycles. Most traffic signals are timed using the operating characteristics of a motor vehicle, which are significantly different uh, than that of bicycles. Cars can travel at much faster speeds and slow down uh, much more quickly than a bicycle. And this is important. Uh, the slower acceleration is important for determining uh, minimum green. Cyclists typically need a longer minimum green time than motor vehicles. And the slower speeds of bicyclists mean that bicyclists need uh, longer clearance time. So we're going to look at two different scenarios for a bike uh, at a signalized intersection. Uh, to determine the appropriate signal timing for a bicyclist. Uh, the first scenario is shown at right, and uh, that's a scenario where a bicyclist is waiting at the stop bar called the standing bicycle. And this is used to determine the standing bicycle crossing time, and that's used to determine what the minimum green time should be for a bicycle. And this is most important uh, when crossing uh, a longer crossing distance. So the uh, standing bicycle crossing time is enough time for a cyclist at the stop bar to react, accelerate, and clear the intersection. So looking at the equation in the upper left, uh, this time includes the PRT, or perception reaction time, uh, which is the time for the cyclist to react at the change of the signal to the green indication. And the remainder of the equation is a time for them to accelerate and clear the intersection. And once we've calculated this standing bicycle crossing time, uh, the minimum green time has to be adjusted uh, such that the, as shown on the right, that the standing bicycle crossing time is equal to the minimum green time plus the yellow change interval plus the red clearance interval. We have an example of calculating the standing bicycle crossing time and minimum green time. In this example, our crossing distance is 52 feet. And with that crossing distance, we get a standing bicycle crossing time of 9.8 seconds. The ye with a yellow and red at this intersection of 4 seconds, the required minimum green time is 5.8 seconds. So this would probably require a slight increase to the existing minimum green time at such an intersection. The second scenario is for a bicyclist uh, approaching the intersection on the green indication, or the rolling bicycle scenario. This is used to determine the clearance times for bicyclists. And this is similar to clearance time calculations for motor vehicles. And this time is based on decision point for cyclists where they need to decide whether to stop 
or proceed through the intersection. And this scenario is used to determine uh, red time and any green time, green extension time necessary for a bicyclist. Looking at this equation on the left, uh, this is the bicycle rolling crossing time. And this is determined using the braking distance plus the crossing distance and the speed of the cyclist. And the braking distance includes uh, the reaction time and also the distance required to stop. And once the uh, rolling bicycle bicycle crossing time is determined, um, we have to make sure that the equation at right is satisfied um, by potentially increasing the green extension time and the red clearance interval. Another example, uh, again, uh, we have a crossing distance of 52 feet. And with this, we'd get a rolling crossing, bicycle crossing time of 6.4 seconds. And with a yellow and red time of 4 seconds, we need an additional uh, extension of red time of uh, 2.4 seconds. And in, if in your jurisdiction the red time can't be extended to accommodate this uh, full 2.4 seconds, um, an extension time should be provided. Uh, the guide states that uh, actuated traffic signals should detect bicyclists. And there are several different ways for uh, detecting bicyclists, including loop detectors. Uh, at loop detectors, the bicycle wheel rims interrupt the magnetic field created by the loop detector. Uh, the image at left uh, shows an example of a pavement marking that can be used to communicate to bicyclists where they need to stop to be detected. And also, um, the sign gives additional information on uh, communicating to bicyclists where they need to stop. And certain type of uh, loop detectors are better at detecting bicycles than others. Uh, the conventional, conventional quadrupole loop showed in the middle uh, can detect, detect bicyclists, uh, but they need to be at a very specific spot uh, along the loop slot in order to be detected. At a diagonal quadrupole loop shown at right, uh, bicyclists can be detected anywhere within the loop. And this type of loop detector is a preferred design. And it's important to note that with any uh, loop detectors, if you're going to be using loop detectors for bicyclists, it's very important to field test and verify that bikes are being detected. Other detection systems, uh, video detection is becoming more common around the country for its uh, ease of installation and maintenance. Uh, it's also more flexible than loop detectors. Uh, but one negative is that uh, there can be missed detection with video detection, uh, especially in low light situations. Another option is uh, microwave or radar detection, which analyzes reflections from transmitter receiver to detect both moving and stationary objects. And the magnetometer uh, analyzes changes in the Earth's magnetic field, and this type of detection is uh, not recommended for bicyclists. And lastly, uh, an option is bicycle push buttons, uh, but the guide states that this should never be used uh, as a uh, primary detection method. Uh, if it is installed, it's very important to take care that it is installed in such a way that uh, bicyclists uh, don't need to dismount in order to depress the push button. Uh, the bike guide does not uh, specifically mention bike signals with bike icons, but it does recognize that there are some instances where uh, it may be appropriate to have a separate signal for the exclusive uh, use of bicyclists. And in that scenario, they suggest uh, a sign indicating bicycle signal. Great. Well, I'm going to wrap up today's webinar with uh, two more topics. The uh, first being the most significant uh, addition to this section of the guide is the discussion of bicycle boulevards and traffic calming.
So first and foremost is the Bicycle Boulevard is discussed uh, from a planning perspective of its value in a network in the ASTO guide. And it stresses that there's these two criteria really that are the uh, how a bicycle boulevard should be determined of whether it's effective or not or, or useful. And it's one that it prioritizes bicycle through travel, so it's t it's efficient and safe. Uh, that bicyclists are given priority of mode and travel along that street through traffic calming over motor vehicles and other. Um, transit, other other types of transportation options. The second and probably the more critical of these two it, uh, to prioritize that bike travel through a corridor is that the cyclist has the ability and to cross uh, major arterials as these typically local streets cross uh, larger uh, arterial streets throughout uh, the network of bicycle of the bicycle boulevard throughout the bicycle boulevard route. Uh, that these crossings should be comfortable and safe, uh, and that they shouldn't in, in cause or impose upon the cyclists an unnecessary amount of delay, uh, thereby negating the benefits of the bicycle boulevard travel. The guide speaks, uh, it doesn't speak to this specifically, but we wanted to discuss it a little bit today, and it's the idea that um, this is a relatively new um, treatment that's being used around the United States. They have been in use for quite a while, um, but there's been a lot of discussion nationally about uh, the term bicycle boulevard. Um, it at times can create uh, positive or negative reactions with, with different local communities. And so communities have been experimenting with these other terms, and it might be something you want to consider in your system. So Bicycle Boulevard, um, a lot of it is getting the travel speeds of motorists to be at or below the typical operating speeds of cyclists. So you're looking at a target um, operating speed of 15 miles an hour to 25 miles per hour. Uh, so that typically is going to mean we're going to be applying some traffic calming treatments. So when you approach a traffic calming project, um, it's natural to think of the bicycle as the design vehicle as far as their comfort, and then from the standpoint of the motor vehicle, uh, implementing a design that achieves your speed reduction goals, or in some cases, volume reduction goals. Generally, if the traffic calming feature is designed well for cyclists, it's going to achieve the traffic calming objectives uh, for the motorist. This photograph at the left is actually a raised crosswalk that was, uh, because of the design of the raised crosswalk, it's very comfortable um, for a cyclist to traverse over, it's very comfortable for the pedestrians as they've got a level surface to cross, and then even large vehicles such as that bus are able to navigate it without bottoming out uh, on the roadway and doing damage to, to their undercarriage. One type of uh, device uh, that may or may not be obvious to some folks is the idea of just a queuing street, a narrow street. Uh, these are very typical in in older street design and are less so in newer uh, street design codes where we've been making streets wider and wider. Uh, but we've actually got a lot of body of research that shows that these narrow streets with parking allowed are some of the calmest streets and the slowest streets and they're really natural streets to be looking at for uh, designating as bicycle boulevards. The next step in uh, traffic calming is considering vertical deflections. Uh, these be speed humps, speed tables, cushions, raised intersections, raised crosswalks. Um, they all have uh, a similar goal of the vertical deflection slows down the motorist, requires them to, to uh, these can be designed to a target speed limit, depending on the height that you develop these treatments at, and the length of the ramping where the elevation change is gained. The key from a cycling standpoint is to make sure that that transition from the road surface to the elevated treatment is smooth and that there's not a real abrupt bump there, which can be very jarring to a cyclist and actually have the unintended consequences of discouraging cyclist travel on a roadway system. Curve extensions are another effective treatment. Um, 
The key feature for these, it's discussed in the guide, is to keep in mind their effect on bicyclists, uh, whether it be a bike boulevard or a bike lane, uh, that they don't extend into the operating, the typical operating space of the cyclist, that these curb extensions should be visible and obvious uh, and not take away from their space and, and, uh, and, surpri and surprisingly pinch them uh, where they're suddenly in, in uh, pinch with put motors coming in close proximity to them unexpectedly. Chicanes are a horizontal, another horizontal type of device. Uh, they're very, very effective at slowing motor speeds uh, depending on the geometry that is chosen for the design. Um, chicanes sometimes involve a narrowing of the roadway, creating a pinch point. Um, here's an example where they narrowed the roadway a little bit they created pinch point, but they actually had the cyclist route behind the traffic island, the chicane itself, uh, so that they weren't suddenly squeezed in, in between the island and the, the passing motorist. If, they're thought, if the design's thought through carefully, there's generally uh, no, it's a, there's no uh, harmful effects on cyclists with this type of treatment. Many traffic circles are another very common, popular treatment. Uh, they slow down through moving motorists by deflecting them, uh, but more importantly, they often create a situation where we can remove stop signs for the cyclists, uh, allowing them to have a greater time efficiencies traveling along the bicycle boulevard. It's preferable, and the guide states it's preferable to install these things and, and to remove the stop signs or consider yield control uh, to, again, preserve that bicycle travel time. Multi-way stops are discouraged as a traffic calming technique from the standpoint of a bicycle boulevard implementation. Uh, they're often ignored by both cyclists and uh, motorists. Uh, you end up with a lot of rolling stops or sometimes people run through the stops completely. Uh, it's preferable, and the guide speaks to it being preferable to go with other treatments such as a mini circle. Uh, there's discussion in the guide about traffic diversion, the effect of traffic calming projects that have traffic diversion on cyclists from the standpoint of an effective bike boulevard. Um, ideal bike boulevard traffic volumes are less than three, 4,000 vehicles a day. If you have a, a street that has traffic volumes that are in excess of that, um, your community may start to discuss uh, different traffic diversion strategies. Um, the key is that the traffic diversion strategy doesn't unduly challenge the cyclists of crossing the, the street if it's closed. Or if you're developing a cul-de-sac neighborhood, such as on the left, you actually create short trail connections and pedestrian connections to maintain that street grid connectivity and you don't sever it. Lastly, the guide has uh, some discussion incorporating the new um, MUTCD signs for wayfinding, and I think the guide has made a real critical distinction here, which is important, uh, that a bike uh, route is not a bike facility. It doesn't imply a liability. Uh, this is something that's been uh, misunderstood for since the last guide was written, and, and even before then, uh, and, it, and created a lot of reluctance for agencies to sign bicycle routes. Um, this guide really emphasizes the purposes of a bicycle guide signs are strictly for wayfinding and navigation. So uh, the guide discusses a number of particular circumstances you may want to do to, to, to apply these, whether it's a system of routes through a community or between communities. Uh, it could just be a route that's a preferable route parallel to an, al an alternative roadway that's uh, maybe not desirable for certain types of bicycle traffic. Uh, or it may be spot-specific guidance to, for transitions between trails and, and on-road connections that are not obvious. Uh, so the guide discusses a number of these examples. The guide also talks about the flexibility that's now uh, implicit in the sign, in the METCD and in the sign design of encouraging and promoting uh, the use of destinations to make the signs, the wayfinding more useful. Uh, that you're using destination names, and they can be place names or city names or street names, uh, that you consider the application of distances and, and direction to these signs. 
Uh, there's now options to um, simplify. You don't necessarily need to have the old bike route sign on top of everything, although it's still an option. Um, you can have the standalone sign series, the D13C that you see there, uh, where the bike symbol is incorporated onto the finger plates uh, together um, for the des that are destination specific. The guide um, also discusses the applications of the and uses for the ASTO state uh, U.S. bicycle routes and applications for the uh, the M18 sign series. With that, we want to thank you for your participation. We wanted to preserve some time for questions. The next webinar will be October 9th on shared use paths. And we'll have James, uh, at this point, take over the question and answer. And we'll answer those as efficiently as we can. Uh, thank you, Bill and Tina. Um, if you have not already done so, please enter your questions into the question box on the screen. Uh, I've already got some questions, and we will get started with those. Uh, first question, there seems to be a trend away from shared lane signs and towards shared markings instead. Can you clarify the usage criteria for those signs? So the guide, uh, I spoke a little bit about this at the last uh, webinar, and then try to emphasize it again this time, because I think it's important an important point. It's going to come down to local jurisdictions and agencies um, setting some criteria potentially for how they want to apply these signs. The guide makes some suggestions, such as using the bikes may use full lane sign. Uh, the bikes may use full lane sign, a narrow lane situation, to share the road sign on wider lane situations or rural road situations. Um, again, but we don't specify a criteria uh, because it's going to come down to being a local decision. Um, they also talk a lot about using the shared lane marking, especially in urban and suburban areas, as a further emphasis of lane positioning to complement the sign. Okay. With, um, with wrong-way cyclists, what factors lead to more crashes for wrong-way cyclists, and how often do you recommend posting wrong-way signs? Well, the, the primary factor with the wrong-way cycling is they're um, going against traffic. It's unexpected. They can uh, encounter other cyclists riding the right way, which creates a situation where one of them has to choose which way to go. Um, and then just through safety studies that have been done over decades now, um, wrong way cycling on the roadway and even on the sidewalk um, just off the roadway but facing against the traffic has been shown to be amongst the highest contributors to cyclist crashes so the mitigations that have been developed thus far are bicycle lanes marking those uh, it's really I think it, shared lane markings with the common theme is the bicycle lane marking is what I'm seeing it's probably one of the key factors of cutting down on wrong way riding in urban areas that there's a marking on the pavement. Uh, the sign of uh, the wrong way riding, posting that sign, it's just a further supplement because it's unclear, honestly. There's no research that says the frequency, but I would suggest that at least probably once per block on a city block or every other block. And the thing you have to remember with that sign is it's the only sign that will actually probably be visible um, to that that user, so it would be um, catch their catch their view. Okay. Uh, in some states, they require cyclists to ride as far right as possible. Uh, do do signs saying that cyclists can take the full lane or that they should take the full lane? Does that cause confusion? This this is a good a great question. It's actually been discussed a lot. Um, Different, a lot of different folks have been talking about this. And it comes down to an understanding of the law. If you're in a 10-foot wide lane and you're riding on the right side of that lane and you need to be a few feet off the edge of the road to be safe, and, and it's as far right as practicable. It doesn't say to be on the right, right most edge of the line no matter what. Um, effectively, you're taking the whole lane because you're going to be riding three to five feet from the left edge, which is basically the middle of a 10-foot lane. 
Um, the place where it starts to become, I think, gray and where people struggle is when you get to lane widths that are 12 or 13 feet, uh, where the lane looks kind of wide and it looks to motorists like they can pass you. And in fact, they sometimes can, but that's they can pass you when they're passing you too close or if you're riding too close to the curb. And that's why we've been clarifying in the positioning and the language of the guide that you don't unintentionally create those situations and, um, where um, you're putting a shared lane marking you know, too far to the right, uh, unlike a 12-foot lane, for example, that you have the option to move it further out uh, to emphasize taking that control. And it's not in conflict with any of the, the state laws to do that. Okay. Is there any guidance for using sharrows in a parking lot, particularly one that um, might connect to a bike path or bicycle parking? The guide does not speak to using shared lane markings in parking lots. So I would, that's kind of a unique application of it. So I would, I would think through your general engineering principles and good sight lines to, to think about how to approach that situation. It doesn't prohibit their use there, but I think it's probably worth a discussion with your local agency on that. Okay, with, with bike lanes directed to the sidewalk on roundabouts, uh, do bicycles, bicycles cross the crosswalk if they're traveling straight, um, or how, how should they traverse such an intersection? Uh, you'll have a couple options, and it'll come down to your design approach to the roundabout. So one option I talked about, uh, say you're in an urban area or you're in an area with a lot of pedestrians, the guide speaks to creating a separate uh, bikeway, essentially, bike only path parallel to the sidewalk. In that case, um, it's easy to envision a separate crossing. Um, other scenarios are the bicyclist is just merging onto the sidewalk. At that point, they become a pedestrian, and in fact, and then they have to follow the, the, the rules of, of a pedestrian. And uh, depending on what state you're in, either dismount and walk their bike through the crosswalk, or they're able to ride through at a slow pedestrian speed. Okay, I know the guy talked about green light times uh, for coming in cyclists. Does it include any factor for if it's an uphill location that might take a cyclist longer to get going? Uh. I think I mentioned it briefly in the beginning of the discussion of traffic signals, um, but the guide has uh, basic uh, so sort of starting points for acceleration values for cyclists. Um, but there, there are certainly different ranges and different, different situations, and if you're at a uh, uphill location, that you could consider using a different acceleration value. Okay. There was one slide that showed a sharrow through a right turn lane. Can cyclists go straight in, in such a case? I mean, a lot of their coming that their understanding is right turn lanes are right turn only, and you're not supposed to go straight. Right. That's a great question. And again, it comes back to local laws and context. And it may be a situation where you do, in that your particular location, you would need to have, add an exception, uh, which is allowed in the METCD to just put in an accept bicycle. It's the same as a situation where you have a bus stop in a right turn lane, and you'll see a right turn only accept buses. Um, so that would be something to consider in that scenario. But again, check with your local local laws for wherever that question is coming from. And at the national committee level on the METCD, we've been talking about uh, creating more exciting examples for these different exception situations such as that. Well, okay, um, what exactly is the difference between a, a bike loop detector from a, a regular loop detector? Are they just more sensitive to bicycle ones? And how do they accommodate uh, carbon fiber bicycles? Uh, I think the, the main difference between uh, a regular loop detector and one that can detect uh, bicyclists is it needs to be checked to see if the um, loop detector is set sensitive enough to detect 
uh, the bicycle. And for uh, carbon fiber, I think even some carbon fiber bikes have the uh, metal wheel rims, and those would be enough to uh, detect the bicyclist. Okay. If you have a shared use path running adjacent to a road, should you also have share the road signs to provide the option for bicyclists to arrive at traffic? I think it's, you know, that's a great idea. And I think, again, it comes back to your local context of if you have a, a network of on-road facilities approaching that bridge, uh, and then suddenly a shared use path develops or a shared use path emerges from another direction and, and just merges with a bridge crossing. Uh, it may be very appropriate to add that sign or the bikes may use full lane sign as a complement. Okay. Are there any indicators or research that explain the pros or cons of having shared bike lanes on narrow downtown streets versus allowing bicyclists to ride on sidewalks legally instead of the roadway? And, and what would be the best practices there? Well, that's a good question. That's a complicated one. It's, um, you know, some cities have ordinances banning sidewalk bicycle riding, um, and I, they're largely driven not out of concerns, I think, for cyclist safety that, you know, again, we have a lot of research that shows cyclists riding on sidewalks, higher risk of injury or crashes, uh, especially in urban areas, but uh, those laws are really passed because of pedestrian concerns with cyclists. Um, interacting with them. So I think you got to first tease out the source of the type of the law and, and why your ordinance is as it is. But, and I think the main factor should first be, you know, making sure the pedestrian space is maintained in a way that is safe for the pedestrians. And then you start to look through logically of what are the best strategies to improve bicyclist safety and you know do you need to have restrictions on sidewalk riding or is it okay or is it age based that if you're a children it's okay but if you're adults it's not uh, so I think it gets really a little complicated the, the guide doesn't speak to that issue exactly other than the guide talks a lot about the fact that cyclists are at greater risk of crashes on sidewalks um, and that um, we have a lot of techniques that can address sidewalk bicycle riding and make it safer by having on-road accommodations. Okay. Does the guide include any, gui any uh, information on sight lines for bicyclists at intersections? Uh, sometimes it might be difficult to, to see cross-street traffic from a bicycle perspective compared to a motor vehicle. Yeah, that's a good question. So that is actually going to be discussed at the next, uh, and you'll for, have to forgive me, I think it's the second uh, the, the second webinar in October. We deal with shared use paths at intersections. It, it has all of the geometric considerations and engineering considerations for sight lines, for vertical curves, horizontal curves, and we, the way the guide's set up is that's all contained in the trail section of the guide but it's equally applicable to on-road cycling. And then, for example, cycle track design, it's critical to understand what those uh, metrics are and how those formulas work. Some states have laws allowing two cyclists to ride side by side. Are there accommodations with shared road designs or signage to encourage or allow for this? The shared lane marking is not intended to imply a single file. Um, I think it's going to come down to some interpretations of the users as we continue to deploy these markings around the United States. And then um, presently, there are no signs that, I'm a, that are official signs um, that are in the Astro Guide or METCD that uh, speak to cyclists riding side by side. Um, that said, people can create those signs. Um, and, and the key thing is figuring out, you know, does, does the, the motorist and cyclist understand the message that's being conveyed? Okay, I think we have time for about one more question. Um, where is the best place to move a bicyclist from a shoulder to a through bike lane on a high-speed facility 
with a very long right turn lane? Yeah, that is a great question, too. That's really context-based, and it, it's going to hinge predominantly on the this geometry design of the speeds of that traffic in that right turn lane. Um, are they merging onto the, the highway they're turning right onto at high speed, or do they have to slow down at the, the end of their ramp and make a, a slower, you know, 15 or 20 mile an hour speed versus 60 mile an hour speed. So I think that's a big factor in making that decision. Uh, the next big factor is traffic volume. Uh, you know, is this a more rural situation where there's only a peak hour, 50 cars doing this versus, uh, you know, Los Angeles where you got maybe a thousand cars doing it? And I think that decision is going to be going to have to vary depending on those contexts. Um, do you have the ability to signalize it at the point? If you can control it to a control crossing, do you have any ability to actually add a signal or an active warning device, uh, like a flashing beacon or something? Um, so the guide gives you a lot of the principles and things to think about, but it, this is a good example of how we can't, we don't have enough information nationally of it really add a lot more specific criteria telling the designer when the cutoff is uh, to make that decision and, wh and how long these merge areas should be. Okay, and, and here's our last question for today. For directional signs, does the new manual contain verbiage that would eliminate concerns from jurisdictions that have expressed concern that installing some, installing these signs constitute the bike route that somehow could be legally construed as increasing their liability? And the guide speaks to the fact it's not a bicycle facility. It's not the same as installing a bicycle lane or a trail uh, or doing a roadway improvement. Uh, it's providing information of where to go somewhere. Um, you know, that said, I, it's, it's conceivable that there could be lawsuits and some lawyers that would continue to try to push forward and say, look, no matter what, uh, we're going to challenge you. But um, the way it's set up is uh, to try to minimize that concern and, and just it's in, it's, and focus on the fact we're providing information, and then it's up to the user how they want to use that information, and that they'll make their own decisions of, of what the uh, how they want to travel and, and what direction they want to travel. Um, but we we want to emphasize it's not uh, try to get away from this sort of paralysis situation where unless we fix everything we can't do anything. Um, that's not what engineering is about. That's not what our transportation system is about. Uh, we, we need to be able to do improvements and, and give people information that, to make choices. Um, and it, it doesn't imply that there's a liability added in doing that type of decision making. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, a lot of liability it can be addressed. Uh, no matter what you're doing, through a strong process of document documentation of your decision-making process. Um, and that's probably the most important thing that an agency can do or you can do as an individual. If you have concerns, even after what we talked about, that uh, you're in a situation that could induce a liability or concern about liability. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for discussion. I'm sorry if we did not get to your question today. Once again, a PDF copy of the slide presentation will be available at www.bicyclinginfo.org slash ashto later today. And a recording of today's program will be posted within a, a couple weeks. Also, we will be conducting three more webinars on the bike guide over the, the next two months. Finally, I want to remind you that a brief survey will appear once the webinar is ended. Again, we very much appreciate you taking a moment to complete it. Thank you again to our speakers, Bill Schulteis and uh, Tina Fink, and thank you to all of you for attending today's webinar.